So my, the first thing is I have to give you a disclaimer, is that I really don't think I'm the best person to do this presentation <laughs> because I'm not that great an orator. Um, but but what, I, what I have experienced over the last, I think probably 15 years, is that I get asked to speak a lot or I speak a lot as part of my job, I think. And so I, do, I have learned a few things along the way. So hopefully some of those things will be helpful for you. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll share them. I'll share them. You know, so in a way, my goal of today is really to help you think about your own presentation style and, and what you might want to do and things that you might take from me or not. And so my first tip is not about presenting. My first tip is about being an audience member, and that is I've learned a lot from other folks. So not only what they say, but also the way they do it, the way they present. So. You know, you might see some things today that you think I do well, and you might say, see some things that wouldn't fit for you, that wouldn't work, and some things that really don't work. So it's okay, you learn a lot from other folks in terms of presentations. Some of the best presentations I've seen haven't used PowerPoint. But <laughs> today, we are focused on, on PowerPoint, um, just because it's a, it's, a, it's a medium that is commonly used. So I'm not suggesting this is the only way to present at all. Um, oftentimes, when you start presenting um, empirical pieces or work that you do, you start to look at conferences, and there'll be these conference calls. And one of the things that I notice with folks is that they often are drawn to certain locations. Like, I would like to go to Barcelona. <laughs> I would like to go to. Montreal, that would be a good conference. And so they lead with location. And I caution you to think about the meeting. <laughs> because the meeting is really important in terms of do you have a fit with your work for that meeting? Because if you don't, it gets quite difficult to present at those meetings. You go in, you present, you often draw a really small crowd because no one's really into what you're doing. And also, you've got no sessions that you really want to go to because you really need the location. So again, think about the fit with the conference um, and be careful about you know, where you go and who you're presenting to. When you write an abstract, so you're, you're writing an abstract to pitch, you found a conference that you want to go to, the idea of writing that abstract is that, for me, oftentimes it's predictive. So if it's an empirical study that I'm wanting to present and I don't quite have the findings, in the abstract, I'll write in the findings like I know. I'll guess a little bit. I have a rough idea about where they're going. And the idea is, is that you then submit that abstract. Usually you've got three to six months to develop the paper and your analysis while it's being considered for the conference. And then by the time they accept your paper as a presentation, You've written the paper. So it's, it's a great kind of catalyst for writing. So I use them in that way. So most of my abstracts, they're, they're really predictive for what I will find. And usually you've got a rough idea. So when you present at the conference, sometimes it's helpful to let the audience know that this was a work in progress and that it is furthered you know, during your time that it's been in review. And what you're presenting today is the current draft of the paper. So that works quite well. Then you'll see when it's accepted, they'll say, oh, you've got a 10-minute presentation. It's been you know, accepted for a 10-minute presentation. And your goal is to never go over that time. You know, um, you shouldn't put the session chair under pressure, the person who has to literally drag you off the stage. You shouldn't you know, put the other presenters in that session under pressure either. Because if you take up time at the front end and they don't have room and they've travelled a long way to present, it's really, really hard on them. And you should always be good to your audience. And your audience is expecting 10 minutes. And that's, that's really your deliverable. Um, with the audience, when the program gets released and you can see who you're presenting with, have a good look. Google them. Know who else is in that session. And just be aware, there might be folks presenting in your session who you really want to meet. There might be folks who you don't want to meet, don't really want to connect with. But it's good to know what you might expect in terms of an audience coming into that room. 
has the conference organisers put together a theme that is cohesive and you're presenting with other folks who you're really into their work. I think it just helps to be prepared in that way. So PowerPoint. You know, um, we are sort of wedded to this idea of PowerPoint and there's been lots of other kind of software. I still think PowerPoint, you know, prevails as one of the mediums, especially when you've got 10 minutes. So a few tricks or a few rules, rather, around PowerPoint. It is one slide per minute. So if we're doing a 10 minute presentation, we've got 10 slides, that's it. And it includes the front and back, the bookend, you know, the introduction slide with your name on it, and the title, and then the back slide that says, you know, thank you and acknowledges your funding sources. So it's 10, all in. There's a little view, the notes view on PowerPoint. When you click on that view, you can then write your script to each slide. I have verbatim write my script. I don't read them verbatim to you, but I've read them two or three times in the last 48 hours so as I can remember around 70% of what I've scripted myself. So I forget about 30% these days, which is okay, but I, script, I over script myself and then I try to get the main points. I find the scripts really helpful. The transition note that I put on that script as well, is if I'm going to do slides that bring in information piece by piece, then I'll actually cue myself to know where those transitions occurred. So I know to hit the button at a certain time to transition new information in. It is a short story in 10 minutes. It is not war and peace. You know, it is, we've got to get in, we've got to capture the interest of the audience, we've got to hold them for 10 minutes, and really, we don't want to bore them and we really want to get into the findings in an empirical paper, and I'll talk a bit more about that. We speak at around about 120 words per minute. Some folks speak quicker, you know, on average. I think it was Steve Jobs who is about 158 words a minute. So the thing with speaking is usually, you know, if we average around 120 words per minute, then what we're looking at ultimately is 1,200 words in 10 minutes for our presentation. So that can help you think about the script a little bit as well. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting about speaking speed is when I speak quickly, it's usually because I'm a little bit stressed or I'm a little bit anxious or I'm a little bit nervous. When I speak slow, it's because I'm fatigued, generally, and I'm having trouble getting the words. So again, you know, just think about your preparation and in coming into it. But we average about 120. Three to four points for each slide. You know, that's it. I don't write long sentences. Um, I don't use capitals. I just use a word or a phrase. I kind of keep it kind of informal. And then oftentimes I'll use those notes as a cue to me to know what to say next. So, you know, I'm looking at font. I'm going, okay, so 24 size font. It has to be legible. You have to be able to see it but 24 and up, and that keeps us to three or four points on our, um, on our slides. I used to agonise over the templates, you know, that you can use, all the different colours and things like that, and I recognised, um, I reckon probably about five years ago, what I was doing was really avoiding writing the content of the speech <laughs> or the presentation, and I was just playing with colours, like a palette, <laughs> and it's great for wasting time, um, but... I sort of have reverted over time just to black on white. Just It's usually pretty simple. It's the most forgiving of poor projectors, bad lighting. You know, it, it gives you the most opportunity. So if you start getting into <coughs> colours, sometimes it can be quite difficult depending on the room that you're in. And also you may have spent more time on the palette than the content. You know, just to say. And, you know, it's a, it's a base utility on most computers. Most, most folks know PowerPoint when you sort of go. I think what's interesting is we try to cram in a lot of information a lot of times. So I can see you squinting at this one. There's a lot of information and so I would have to apologise. I'd literally have to say to you, I'm sorry you can't see this. I'm sorry what I'm trying to say is, and then I've got two, two figures here that I'm going to have to explain and I've got a minute. So it's, if you've got to apologise for it, it shouldn't be there. So the point of this slide is to say, 
you know, if you're going to use the figures and you're going to use tables, think about the point that you want to make with that particular table and only use one table. So in contrast, I'd say to you, with this one, it's still busy. So I'd introduce this by saying, there's 14 things that we built into a website to help men quit smoking. And we asked those men, we said, what do you think would be helpful? And then we tracked those men about what they used. So if you note here, tactics for getting started, guys thought, about 57% of the guys thought that they would, that would be helpful, but the usage was way higher at 80%. And inversely, the expert chat, a high amount, 80% of the guys thought that, they would, that would be helpful, but it only ended up at 20% used it. So my point in sharing this is to say that when we do usability testing or pilot testing websites, perhaps it really doesn't help us know what to build because we've already built it. So again, just trying to get into a space of telling you what the what the major point of sharing this with you is, rather than belabouring the 14 pieces on there. PowerPoint's interesting too, you know, sometimes I see folks use video, and I love using videos if I can, but in 10 minutes you're going to be hard pressed to do that. And if you do, you're kind of obliged to have it working, so you have to know there's audio, you have to be able to embed it in your slide in a way that you don't have to go in and out of applications, and so, because you're under a bit of time pressure. And also, it has to make a very slick point, very, very quickly. So it can only be a very short excerpt. And if we're waiting for it to load, it's still on your time clock. Right. So again, you know, videos might be a bit ambitious. I think pictures can be very helpful. I try to use pictures more than text, if I can. So something like this, I'd say there's a wonderful website that we've developed. What it does is, it brings men in who are experiencing depression. And on this website, we've attracted more than 250,000 unique visitors in the last 12 months. And within that context, 24,500 guys have filled out an evaluation of depressive symptoms. I encourage you to take a look at this website, and the URL is there for you to, for you to connect with. So again, it's a, it's, it's a piece that you might remember, some of the branding about the website. It captures your attention, and I give you a context, and I'm in, and then I'm out. So the anatomy of, a, of an empirical paper presentation, the front end, it's great if you can position a problem, an overarching issue. And you've got about 1.5 minutes to capture the crowd with this issue. So the idea that you bring them into a context, something they might not have even ever thought about, and you bring them into a space of going, wow, that's, that's quite interesting. And it might be provocative, you know, it might really engage, it might be a bit dramatic, or it might also be linked to what you're going to do in terms of application that's going to address this problem. So that's one of the things you want to do. So, for example, I would start with something like men's depression and suicide is really uh, a topical area, very important. There is particular discord about the low rates of men's depression and the high rates of male suicide. There's also a difference in how men present early on with depression, oftentimes with irritability, anger, alcohol overuse, over-involvement in sports and work. And then when we think about men as a whole, there's great diversity within subcategories of men because First Nations men, gay and bisexual men are at much higher risk for depression and suicide. So I've, got, I've given you the context of men's depression and suicide. I've done it with three words and I've narrated around it and I've tried to bring you into a conversation about an issue, and then I would start to unpack some of my findings. Methods are interesting too. You are, you are obliged to tell your audience something about how you did the work you did. And so I would always err on the side of, I did a qualitative study, it was individual interviews, 
And then I'll try and share with you something about the feasibility of having done that work. What was challenging for me was we had a hell of a time recruiting. And we tried online. We tried you know, putting flyers up in public spaces. Had an enormous amount of difficulty. And then what we found was when we went through Craigslist, we were able to recruit a lot of men into the study in that way. So you're trying to share something with the audience about your process for having done the work. Not so much about you know, the nuts and bolts of the methods. You know, Not so much. It's applied. Try to be applied in it. And then the findings. And so the findings are, are really the heart and soul of your presentation in an empirical study that you're presenting especially. So again, I would be inclined to spend half of my presentation time on the findings and doing it in a way that would connect it to broader conversations but also my the issue that I've laid out up front. So for example, so in the study of men with suicidality, we gave them, uh, we gave them uh, cameras, asked them to take photographs of their experience. One of the things that we found common to all of the men that we spoke to is this notion of inferiority whereby they will internalise the problems they're experiencing, but they will also internalise the idea of getting their own self-remedy going. So from this 24-year-old participant who submitted a paper, who submitted photographs, including this one of the padlock, he says, this is a combination lock and it really shows a physical example of how you get locked down. Lock in your thoughts. Thinking that there's never any light at the end of the tunnel. Well, the things aren't going to get better. And then when that lock gets closed, that's when you know you're really likely to feel sorry. When the lock is still open, you can see that there's hope. And you're less likely to feel sorry. So if you don't know the combination, then you don't know how to get out of the depression and the suicide. But if you know the combination, you know how to unlock. So again, what we see in this quote from this gentleman is this notion of self-management and the intricacies of self-management. When we talk to all of the guys, unfortunately some of that self-management was ineffectual because it often relied on alcohol and other drug overuse. So again, I've broached a piece of the findings, drawn you into the data. The picture does a nice job too because it draws you into an analysis of your own and tries to bring you into a space of thinking about, gee, you know, how people represent things. So that would be five minutes of your presentation. The last couple minutes, the tail out is to hook back in to what your promissory notes were at the front end of the, of the presentation. So to go back to that, see how you've explain how you've delivered the application of your findings, how it's going to make a difference to men's suicide and depression in this case. And then signal the end. You know, so draw into you know, your conclude, concluding comments and then thank, provide a thank you and really let them know that, that you kind of finished. Oftentimes that last slide where we acknowledge other people who have contributed to our research and our funder. So we don't do the Oscar speech, we don't name them all. We just, we just have them there and we just point to them, and it does, it, it does its own work. So often the last slide when you're taking questions, if you have something like this, then folks know who's on your research, and they know that it was funded or who, who helped you with the research. So some final points. Yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you can put the references up at the end. If you've sort of cited some things, um, then Absolutely. As a, as a tail out slide, I've never done it. Yeah. It's not to say that it's, oh, I've seen it, I've seen it, and I think it can be helpful for folks, and oftentimes people will connect with you and, and, and ask for particular sources as well. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if they said to me you've got a 10 minute presentation, that's your presentation time, and then they're doing the Q&A, for a five-minute Q&A after, or they're bundling the Q&A after three ten-minute sessions. But yeah, I just work with whatever convention they give me as my talking time. So if it was eight minutes plus two minutes for for, for questions, then I trim. Yeah, yeah, whatever they say.
Um, rehearsals. So I did this. I I, uh, I was trying to be better, you know, at, at you know talking. And so um, there's this thing on my uh, computer that I discovered, and you can video yourself as you're talking. I don't recommend it. I like, <laughs> completely freaked out. I was like horrified at how bad I was. Um, Oh, it was terrible. Anyway, so anyway, I found the delete button, so I'm okay, and, and the therapy's worked out fine. But just to say, um, uh, I think you can rehearse uh, just audibly. You know, I think that can be really good. You can record it and sort of hear it back, and, and you kind of know. Um, I do generally go through pretty well everything before I do it, and then on the day I will go through it as well, just to, so it's clear to me. Pauses and pacing is really interesting. So sometimes if I am a bit up and a bit nervous, I will talk quickly. And if I am genuinely fatigued, then it will be tougher to get through. And what I find is the more fatigued I am, the more filling words and sentences and phrases I use. And there's some really good examples there about you know, how we get into those patterns. So good sleep helps you know, in terms of being ready and being on. And I think the other thing is one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was if you're doing, if you're doing too many ums and ahs, then breathe. Take a silence and breathe. So try to just not fill the space. Because sometimes we're worried that if it's not sound, then we won't hold the audience. So in some ways, just taking a little bit of space instead of filling it with an arm or an R or a filler is probably going to be better for you. Um, I think clarity and complexity is interesting too. The assumptions that are made about people in the audience knowing every abbreviation that you come up with, an acronym and things like that, you know, there's lots of leaps of logic. Because even in healthcare, you know, we, we make up a lot of our own kind of you know, um, abbreviations. And so I think that it helps to kind of be very clear about what you're referring to um, and keeping it nice and plain and simple so that it's accessible. And there will be people who might be expert in the room and their questions might be a bit deeper than other folks, but I think if you pitch it at a level where everyone can engage it, then those questions you can still answer at the end if there's something where someone wants, you know, more sort of detail and complex kind of thing. Game day. So self-talk. I often, you know, I, I battle with myself. So some days when I talk, I can hear myself and it's awful. So I try to just get in the space of psyching myself into, I'm doing this presentation, I'm trying to help these folks, but also I'm trying to honour the data that I collected. I'm trying to give out some information that I believe is important. So I always stay away from that self-talk of, it won't be good enough, it's not, it's not really that exciting, you know, they're not really going to be interested. So I try to keep it up, you know, in terms of my own self-talk, self especially on the day. I don't speak to many people on the day. So I haven't spoken much this morning, so I've kept to myself. So I didn't want to waste my words early on. So again, you kind of get to know yourself a little bit, but one of the worst things that ever happened to me early on was I was pre-conference, I was about an hour before I was presenting, I was on a coffee break, someone asked me about my presentation, and I gave them my presentation like as we're having a conference. And then I get in the room and I'm like, I couldn't remember what I had and hadn't said, right? Like it, it was too close. I'd given off everything. And I don't know. And I've, and I've seen people do it. And you, I kind of undoes myself. You know, it really undid me. So I, I try to keep to myself a bit, uh, try to get a little bit of, of quiet time and then come into the space and, and deliver, the, deliver the piece. Sometimes that's hard because the order of things is that you might be the third presenter and you're in the room and you're having to listen to those other two 10 minute presentations and the truth is I often tune out, you know, and that's, I just try to, you know, just not get too involved, just sort of try and keep it nice and superficial so that I'm, so that I'm okay to go in and do my bit. The tech check, I do not trust any technicians in terms of when they say load it after to be there for you. So I always go in the room and check myself um, and especially if I'm using anything to do with audio. One of my worst ones was 
I had done the presentation, I'd spent hours on this presentation, had it all beautifully scripted, and then they loaded it on a Mac, and I'd done it on a PC, and everything moved. Everything was off. And so I just, I really think that, you know, you kind of got to make sure um, that when you, you've spent all that prep, you really want it to be as good as it can be. So I do my own tech checks. There's no roadies here as far as I know in terms of people that really um, make 100% sure. So again, just, you know, due diligence with that. Um, my mum used to say to me always, it's nice to look nice. Um, so the idea of, um, if you're presenting at a professional meeting, then I think it's nice to feel comfortable. It's nice to feel like you're fitting in with the, uh, with the discourse and the theme. And so again, it's about being comfortable. It's about feeling, you know, like you're there to present and feeling good. And so I think sometimes thinking about that is helpful. And audience, big or small, you know, um, I used to say, and it was true until, you know, kind of a, a little bit later on in my career when I got a couple of invited speeches. My biggest audience was eight, you know, for about, I think it was 12 years. The biggest number of people that ever came to a presentation of mine was eight. And, and that's okay. You, you deliver exactly like if the room was full. And inversely, when the room starts to fill up and it gets bigger and there's, and there's more people interested in what you're doing, you know, then it's the same thing. You present just like, you know, you would have anyway. It's the same. And so people are there to see you. So never be discouraged about too few or overwhelmed by too many. The idea is that you just deliver on what you promised you would do. That's really the, the currency of it. We talked about pacing yourself. You know, again, if you feel like you're going too quick, just take a breath and slow down. Um, I try to stay close to the script because in 10 minutes, if I go off on a tangent, then I'm, the chances are I'm lost and I'll have trouble drawing it back into the slide and the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and I do overscript myself because I do forget, I know of myself, I forget about 30% of what I'm going to say. So again, just trying to stay close to it. I try to vary voice, you know, do try to speak up, make it audible. Um, I like to be able to, you know, be in rooms like this where you're not mic'd up. I don't like being mic'd up so much. You know, sometimes you have to be. But just keeping voice up. I've met each one of your eyes during the presentation. The idea that I'm getting a sense of whether you're engaged or not. And so I might summon you. I might actually lobby you for a comment at some point, you know, in, in some ways in presentations as well. And I'm looking for questions at the end. So again, when the call question time, I would be looking out. I wouldn't be looking down. I'd be looking out and seeing if there's something coming forward for them. Um, you know, the emphasis on pausing, if you pause and let people consider, you know, those that table where there was those 14 items, you know, that figure, um, again, a pause there and try and give people time to digest some of the information that's there, you know, can be very helpful. Um, I, I avoid slang where I can. <laughs> and you know that's true of my class in 540A. I never used slang, ever. Everyone understood all the colloquial terms I used because I explained them. That's right. <laughs> and, and never do this. Never go, don't read the slide verbatim because the audience <laughs> tends to get a bit lost in that, especially when you turn your back and you're talking for it. So, and I've seen that happen a lot because you might not have the monitor in front of you and be able to sort of just dart across. So, so. so in conclusion, I'd like to say at the front end of this talk today, what I hope to share with you is some of the things that I've learned along the way. And I sincerely hope that that's been the case. Right? There's a few things that help you drive forward. Know that the people in the audience always want to see you succeed. You know, there's, there's rarely hecklers. I haven't seen any hecklers for a long time. <laughs> and I ignore them when they do show up. So, um, you know, so I really do hope that going forward, you know, your presentations can, uh, can be enhanced by a little bit of what we shared today. So, thank you very much. Thank you.
So we're just going to switch to posters and uh, talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of putting together a research poster. I, I'm hopeful that since I'm doing the poster part rather than the oral presentation that the bar set a little bit lower for my presentation. Um, so keep that in mind. <laughs> So I'm the grant facilitator here in the school, and uh, I work with a lot of faculty and graduate students who are looking for a little bit of support around how to do the poster or, or what they might need to keep in mind. So these are some of the kind of tips and tricks that I've learned working with faculty and students. And uh, so I thought I would just start off with a little bit of the nuts and bolts, and then we can actually look at a few examples and um, some final considerations about about what you might actually need for the day of a poster presentation. In terms of software, um, maybe there's some, some designers in the room that are really comfortable with the, the fancy layout programs like Adobe InDesign. Uh, there's lots of other stuff on the market, but by and large, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint will do what you need it to do. And it's, it's actually pretty easy to use. Um, you can just change the dimensions of the single slide that when you first open up the, a new file to what you want your poster dimension. So unless you're doing a really radically enormous um, poster size, uh, mostly it will serve all your needs. Um, and most people are quite familiar with Microsoft uh, Word and that, that whole kind of office suite. So you won't have to kind of agonize about how to insert a picture, or insert your text. Um, so that, that would be my, my recommendation. And uh, I have some handouts that I'll share with everybody afterwards with some step-by-step -step on how to, how to do that. So just for some general design considerations, if you ever get a chance to have a look at this book, the Non-Designers Design Book, um, it's really uh, a quick and dirty how to think about layout and design for people who don't actually have a background in design. It can really up, up your game in terms of uh, doing a nice poster. But her uh, basic um, tips are around using contrast, uh, repetition, alignment, and proximity to uh, help with your design. And you can see how, how the, the two examples here are uh, dramatically different just, just using those um, kind of simple uh, principles in terms of avoiding uh, elements that are a little bit similar either make them exactly the same in terms of font and size and line thickness or make them very different. And then, and then using that sort of repeat, repeating um, look and feel and then alignment and proximity to group similar and uh, different objects together. So we'll talk about this again a little bit in the actual poster examples. But some other specific layout uh, considerations when you're thinking about how to place things on the actual poster slide is to not bring things right to the, the edge of the, of the poster. And, and in printing terms, they call it the, the bleed. And quite often, things get locked off at the end because they actually cut the page. So um, leave a little border around your pages. Um, use high enough resolution images that you're not going to get blurry pictures when you print up. So a good rule of thumb is between 150 and 300 uh, dots per inch. Um, avoid those kind of fills and pattern prints because um, again, it tends to just look a little bit messy and uh, um, too busy for posters. Um, definitely use the, the sort of temporary guidelines that you can use uh, in PowerPoint for snapping your text boxes and your images so that you have nice alignment. And uh, just a kind of green point, um, if you want more sustainable uh, printed posters, um, keep the background white. It, it's usually good for readability, but also you're not using up a lot of uh, what are sometimes toxic inks. And again, with suggested font size, just like with the PowerPoint slides, I mean, people are standing within a couple of meters of your, your poster. If they have to press their nose against your poster to read the fine print, it's, it, it's probably not going to be read, right? So as just a, a general guideline, main title is 100 point, um, subheadings 50 point, and then body text uh, kept to minimum, but at 25 point font. For standard poster sizes, always defer to your conference guidelines. Um, but these are some pretty standard um, poster sizes. Keep in mind that conference guidelines sometimes are the size of the board that you have, and sometimes they're specifically the size of the poster that they want. So make sure you make a distinction between those. And most printers, or at least the UBC printers that we often use here, 
their big big printers max out at 42 inches and then they can go as long as you want. So these are some pretty standard sizes and um, in terms of the grad symposium I think they'll be announcing their specific uh, poster size guidelines shortly. But that's, these are the kind of dimensions you'd be entering right into your PowerPoint slide. And then in terms of actual content considerations, um, again, this follows some of the points that John made in his talk about, you know, making two or three key points the focus of your, of your uh, poster because essentially it's a single slide. Um, ad adapting your materials to actually suit your audience. So thinking about who's going to be looking at your poster and what kind of uh, level of information would be suitable to them. Um, Limit the statistical stuff, like if you've got a, a stellar image, great, but again, if it's, if it's got a million little dots on it, how much is really going to be read if people are standing two or three meters away from your poster? If you can simplify charts or use really simple tables, that's ideal. Um, and if you do have a table or a chart, it's nice to include a couple bullet points in terms of what people should be seeing when they look at, at that um, chart. Um, and again, if you have to use some statistical details, um, some simple confidence intervals sometimes can be drawn right in, uh, or the p-values just to show which ones are, are uh, um, of note. Oops. So these templates are actually available on the UBC IT services, and this is what a kind of standard research poster looks like. It usually has a, a short introduction section, maybe a little methods material section, um, results, and a conclusion. And if, if you want to include two or three references, it would probably be done right around there. Um, of course, depending on your topic or the kind of uh, work you're talking about, it, it could have um, shifted a little bit. But that's a pretty standard look. And then, like I said, these templates you can pull right off the IT website. So that'll be on the handout I'll pass out afterwards. So again, here's another example, pretty standard, they've got a title, they throw in some logos, um, they might have a couple of figures. And of course, if you're a real design whiz, um, you know, sometimes like you, you see the odd poster that they've really, they've either, they had funding to bring in a graphic designer who is able to really um, illustrate some interesting points uh, in a really dynamic way. It can be great, but but this, this isn't what I usually see. The other kind are much more common and people are really familiar with how to read them. Um, so so don't wanna, I don't want to deter you from doing something a little bit more elaborate, but don't feel uh, compelled that this is what you should be shooting for necessarily. So when you're thinking about what makes a poster good or bad, I always suggest the best way to do it is to go look at a bunch of posters. And so in the, the far hallway here at the School of Nursing, um, there's a hallway that has dozens of posters. One of the best ways is to wander up and down, have a look at the posters, see the ones that really work for you, the features that you think might uh, adapt well for the topic and material that you're going to be looking at. Um, but there's some pretty key features that you're going to see kind of recurring in posters that work. One is that you can read it and that you can read it standing um, a little bit away ways from it. Two, that the, it's relevant to the audience. So um, if you're thinking about the grad symposium, for example, you'll want to, you, you know, you won't be able to highlight the nursing relevance, the relevance to nursing practice, perhaps. Um, and that the takeaway message is clear. Like, if you have a ton of content on your poster, and at the end of the day, people still aren't really clear what was done and why it's important, why it's significant, um, it's going to have less impact. And, and then, don't be afraid to engage with graphics because it is a poster. So having some visual element to the poster can really help draw people in to have a look at it in the first place and also stay with them in terms of what their takeaway message was. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples. This is a doctoral student who did a poster um, several years ago. And as you can see, she stuck with the, the really kind of uh, standard poster layout kind of process, but it, it works really well. She used a highlighting color, she used a couple of graphic images, um, she kept her text to, to a minimum, she had some larger kind of headings, a couple of quotes from her findings groups. So really clean, um, works really well. 
this was one uh, done with a faculty member, and her challenge uh, was that it was around best practice guidelines. So it wasn't a typical research paper in the sense of the, the usual you know, methods, analysis, and you know, results. And she also had a, a case scenario that she really wanted to share. So again, we still we still used um, sort of the content columns, really made sure we used some nice alignment, used sort of a highlight color, um, and then boxed off a, a, a sort of case, case scenario on the side. So depending on the kind of content that you're trying to communicate with your poster, like I said, you might have to adapt your layout a little bit. But just think clearly about your visual elements and, and how it fits on the page as well. So here's another one. And this was interesting in terms of thinking about your audience, because this was a, another faculty member's poster, but they were working with a community group. So not only did they want the symposium or the conference that they were presenting at for it to be an effective poster, but they really wanted the group of uh, in this case, community men's group that was working with them to be happy with the poster. So they, the, the men in this group were actually quite thrilled because they really liked the, the sort of blueprint, kind of, they thought it was kind of masculine looking with the, the bridge and because um, you know, the program is called Building Bridges. So, so this was a case in that she was actually working with two audiences, her community partners as well as her kind of conference uh, audience. And here's another one. I, I would say maybe the colors um, aren't ideal here, but one thing I thought was kind of nice with this uh, student one um, was that she was doing a lot of qualitative uh, research, and so she had a lot of quotes. And she really wanted to highlight maybe perhaps too many in this case, but again, just thinking creatively about how to um, visually display some of the findings from your work. Um, there's lots of ways to think about it. So I would definitely recommend to have a look down our hallways and, and have a look at what you think is working. And a, one other option to think about too is that ultimately research post posters are about knowledge dissemination, about you know connecting and networking with, with your research colleagues. Um, and so sometimes uh, ha having handouts uh, that can accompany your poster can be nice because, I mean, I think now with mobile phones, people can just take a snapshot of your poster, but um, to be able to give a little handout for people who are really interested in the topic, who might want to know more, who might want to in future connect with you or collaborate with you. Um, it could be a simple, simple, simple takeaway uh, slide sheet, a little executive summary, or even just the basics, the title, abstract, and con uh, contact information. And then in terms of costs, uh, the handout that I have for everyone here is based on the IT uh, printing services, which is just over here in the IRC in their basement. Um, so it's very convenient. You can just literally upload your file to their website and go pick it up the next day if you've submitted it before their deadline time. Um, but of course, there's plenty of printing options um, all over town, whatever works for you. But this is some basic price, price points. Um, and so I usually see posters. It used to be where they'd always get laminated, so they'd be a little bit more than 100. They'd be more like 120. Um, but there's a range depending on what kind of price point that you're you're thinking of. Thinking of. And then what's been kind of the new technology in poster printing is these fabric posters, um, particularly for people who are traveling by a plane um, to present a poster, hauling tubes. Nobody wants to do that anymore. You can, you can actually have your poster printed on fabric and just fold it up and put it in your suitcase. So a lot of our faculty who do a lot of uh, poster presentations um, around the country are loving these fabric posters. And the, the price point isn't that much higher. The, the printing is a little, the resolution's a little bit lower. So just in terms of keeping the, the size of the font and the lines a little bit clearer, um, that helps. But but again, there's a bunch of examples in the hallway kind of down near that end. So if you want to have a look at those two as options, it's worth checking out. And I sometimes see this sort of online kind of idea around uh, research posters too in terms of what do you do with your poster afterwards? Is it content that could be re reused in another way? So I always think about um, sort of life after the conference bulletin board as well. And then that's all I have. So if you want to open it up to questions for both for me and or John. Yeah.